All right. Hey, Facebook. Welcome to Theology on Air, which is part of Theology on Tap. And if you're watching today and you want to participate, we'd love for you to put any questions you have in the comments section um, down below. And if you ask a question I think would be good for our folks, then I will pitch it to them uh, later on in the show. What should Christians think of the gender binary? What does the Bible have to say about transgender people? What is gender? And how does the way that we think about it affect us in our theology and in our world? We're going to be talking about all of that and more on today's episode of Theology on Air. Welcome back to Theology on Air. I am Sarah Stone. I'm the Outreach Director for Young Adults at MDPC, and I'm going to be hosting alongside Evan McClanahan today for today's show. So Evan McClanahan is the pastor of First Lutheran here in Houston, and we have two very special guests. I'm so excited about today's conversation. First, the Reverend Dr. Megan Rohr is the first openly transgender pastor ordained in the Lutheran Church and currently serves as the pastor of Grace Lutheran Church and the community chaplain coordinator for the San Francisco Police Department. Uh, Megan, some of you guys might recognize Megan from being featured on Queer Eye and Cosmo Magazine, uh, our own celebrity, pretty excited. And then of course, Dr. Robert Gagnon is a professor, excuse me, a professor of theology at Houston Baptist University. He has degrees from Dartmouth College, Harvard Divinity School, Princeton Theological Seminary. Uh, he's the author of the widely acclaimed book, The Bible and Homosexual Practice, Texts and Hermeneutics, as well as a bunch of other books and articles on sexual ethics. And he has been cited in the New York Times, NPR, CNN, and US News and World Report. So these guys are, uh, they're pros. And we're just so, so, so excited. For those of you that are kind of new to Theology on Air, uh, this is a live radio show and podcast that was born out of a ministry called Theology on Tap. Uh, Theology on Tap is a ministry to young adults in Houston where we talk about all kinds of um, cultural, theological, philosophical ideas and all over really delicious craft beer. And we have a really uh, large diversity of voices on our leadership panel, which means we get a large diversity of thought in our audience. And so I'm excited to have two very different voices today that will be sparring a little bit. We like to have some fun, but we also uh, love to be charitable and winsome in the way that we approach each other because we're all trying to figure out what the Bible means and how to follow Christ best. So, um, and of course, if you are listening online or you want to keep us going online, KPFT is listener supported community radio. Um, if you want to give to keep this going so we don't have to have commercial breaks, if you ever listen to podcasts where they're like, and now I'd like to thank my friends at cue the product, we don't have to do that here. Um, so you can go to kpft.org to learn more about um, giving and of course, give in the name of Theology on Air so we get a little shout out. All right, we've got all the boring stuff out of the way. We're going to get to our conversation. The way we're going to do this today is I'm going to ask Megan and Robert if they will both give, I don't know, seven or eight minutes of just what do you think the Bible has to say about the gender binary? What is it all about? Um, and of course, you'll have opposing thoughts. And so when you're done, we'll let you each react to the other one. And then there'll be a million questions, I'm sure. But and of course, we want to hear a little bit of your own stories as well. So, Megan, how do you feel about going first? Sure, I would love to. All right, take us away. All right. Well, thank you for having me on. Uh, I, I actually think it might be surprising today. Dr. Gagnon and I are actually going to agree on most of our theology. We just might agree on what it means that we agree. Mm -hmm. um, and we both love God, right? So that's the most important agreement that we have. We both believe traditional interpretations of scripture define this conversation. And surprisingly, we both believe that the sacred worth of trans people is centered in Genesis 1 and 2. Mm. Dr. Gagnon argues that trans people are so far outside of God's love and creative imagination that we disrespect God because he believes Genesis 1 through 2 is a metaphor about the body being a temple. I believe it should be read literally. God takes a non-gendered human, puts them to sleep, divides them into bits that are female from bits that are male, read literally, this original creation sounds a lot like God was the first gender confirmation surgeon. Each time Dr. Gagnon tries to change the subject to gay men, I will recenter the conversation to the normalcy of bodily transfiguration, the sacredness of name changes in the Bible, 
And I'll show that even if I'm wrong, Jesus will still save me. Mm. Yes. As it is written in Psalm 30, verse five, God's anger is but a moment, but God's love lasts forever. When the great day comes that I stand before God, I feel confident that Jesus's life, death, and resurrection will save me so completely that I am powerless to undo it. Hmm. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound, it shall save a wretch like me. Also, I feel confident that God will be okay with the fact that I spend as little time as possible imagining the shape and the functions of private parts of others. <laughs> Instead, I spend my time and energy loving the Lord my God with all my heart, with hmm. all my soul, and with all my mind, and doing the best I can to love my neighbor as myself. What this means is that I look to rabbinical tradition about the readings of the book of Genesis. And I recall that the text says, male and female, God created them. Literal readings should remember the word and exists in that passage. Changing it to male or female, God created them, is a choice. I prefer the literal reading. In the Hebrew, biblical pronouns fluctuate more than is ever captured in the English translation. Those who are interested in this, you can read more from Rabbi Mark Samoth, who wrote the name, the dual gendered names for God. Adam is referred to as them in the Bible. During the flood, Noah repairs her tent. Rebecca is referred to as a young man. And Mordecai is called Esther's nursing father. You might think this is crazy leftist Bible translation, but how many of you in Bible school when you were little kids sang this? Rock of my soul in the bosom of Abraham, rock of my soul in the bosom of Abraham. The theology about Abraham was that he could nurse you the way a female would, that spiritual love and sharing of education is something where you can be both masculine and feminine in the same body, and God adores it. The big question then is, can human beings do other modifications to their body after the creation? Would God be okay with it? Or would God not be okay with surgical modifications after creation? Rock of my soul in the bosom of Abraham. Abraham is told by God, change your private parts. Circumcision is a surgical altering of private parts. Abraham is not only supposed to do this to his own body, but to more people than there are stars. Hmm. All the followers are to change their private parts. It even goes as far in Genesis to say, if you don't modify your private parts, God will cast you aside. We know this to be true because think of how much Paul writes about circumcision, trying to let people know, don't worry. If you choose not to modify your private parts, God can still love you. If we stuck if we stayed centered literally in the Bible, it would be the burden of proof on people who choose not to have surgical changes done to their private parts to show that God loves them. But I know a lot of the arguments that are going to come from Paul or come from readings of Paul, pay attention when you hear that, because it's going to come from the first through four chapters of the books of Paul. The beginning of Paul's books always start with a list of people that it's easy for groups of people to be against. But every one of Paul's letter ends the same way. Nothing, neither death nor life, nor principalities, nor things present, nor things to come can ever separate you from the love of God. Paul says you can choose the law or you can choose the freedom of the cross, but you can't have both. When given a choice, I choose the cross, I choose to follow Jesus, and I choose to be centered in this idea that transfigurations happen. What does it mean that Jesus goes on top of a mountain and Jesus's body changes? What does it mean that how important it is that Jesus's body is caught, scarred and cut, not surprisingly in the same place Adam was? What does it mean that after he comes back from the grave, 
and is resurrected, no one recognizes the physical body of Jesus. Bodily changes are sacred. Name changes are sacred. When you have an important encounter with God, your name changes. All of these things that trans people might experience in their life are a part of a sacred journey. In fact, I wrote a book as well. It was actually featured in Wittenberg, Germany for the 500th anniversary of, of the Reformation. And in the back, it has 247 different words used around the world to name trans people as sacred simply because they were trans. It includes also a prayer calendar that has at least 17 saints from the ancient Christian church of people who were trans and considered saints just because they were trans. Loving God is possible if you have a mind and a body and a heart that is centered on Christ. Mm -hmm. Conversations about private parts never were on Jesus's list. And if it's good enough for Jesus that we are to love our neighbor and that we are to love God, then I too believe we can center ourselves in that. So that's where I, I hold my theology. Wow, that's so fascinating. By the way, I will say this for the people watching on Facebook, we have a lot of thoughts coming in, but so far only a couple questions. So I am gonna ask if you're watching on Facebook and you wanna ask a question, maybe just put a cue in front of it because I'm trying to listen and watch the comments. So if it's just like, I agree or I disagree, that's fine. But uh, anyway, I'll just ask that that small thing. But all right, Dr. Gagnon, I'm sure you have lots of thoughts of your own and then we'll respond to each other. But but take us away with your own thoughts on this. Are you with us? Well, <clears throat> we can all clean ourselves up on the outside but hires to do things that God doesn't want us to do. It's why God is in the business of holistic transformation of, of our lives, a complete total home makeover where we want to do things as we want to do, when we want to do it, with whom we want to do it with. Jesus instead gives us a message of discipleship to take up our cross, to deny ourselves, to lose our lie and to come follow him. And where do we receive our help from this? We receive our help from the love and power of God. How do we know the path or the way to life that God gives us? God gives us that in a clear and consistent witness in his revealed word through Jesus through his use of the scriptures that were authoritative for him in the Old Testament, through the apostolic witness to Christ. And there is a clear and consistent witness of Jesus on human sexuality. Scripture has to be our priority in terms of deciding what the truth is. Yes, there are arguments from reason, both philosophical and scientific, and experience has some role to play, but no experience is self-interpreting. We understand our experience through the lens of the consistent witness of Scripture about the matter of sexual ethics. The gender binary, can you all hear me? It's freezing up a little bit. Um, I will say if you have your phone nearby and you can go to Wi-Fi in there, anything on your computer that's already using Wi-Fi, shut it down. I find that helps a little bit. But uh, we've mostly gotten what you've said. You froze a little bit at the beginning and there a little bit just now. Okay. Uh, well, let's see. How would I do it on the phone? That's a good question. I don't think I have Zoom on my phone. If you have an iPhone, you just swipe down from the top and hit the little... I might uh, have to. Do you need to go out and come back in? I think I might have to go out and come back in. I apologize. So let me let me boot let me shut down, reboot, and see how it goes. That's okay. okay. We'll talk amongst ourselves while you're gone. There's we'll a lot to yourselves. talk about. All right. Megan, I will say that probably after he finishes his thoughts, one of the things we might need to do is just to um define gender. Gender as opposed to or with 
sex or sexuality. I think Dr. Gagnon might do that differently from you. I have a, a close friend who might be watching right now, uh, married to a trans man who says, um, and I think she got this from Oprah, but that uh, sex is what's between your legs and gender is what's between your ears. I don't know if that resonates with you or not. Feel free to say whatever you want about that now while we're waiting for Dr. Gagnon to come back. I think the interesting thing about where we are in in trans studies and about trying to figure out how people describe themselves is that part of the ethos of of LGBTQ studies of of trans studies is that people self-identify and they kind of sometimes define the terms for themselves. My experience is that terms are very regional. So I grew up in South Dakota and how we use terms like gender or sex is very different than here in San Francisco. And, and yeah. my, my impression is probably also um, in Texas. And so uh, for some people, sex is about private parts, unless you ask questions about like, what happens if someone has breast cancer, right? So we, so we have really firm ideas of what it means, but sometimes some wiggle room um, based, on, based on just kind of the complications of human experience. Um, for some people, there is this idea of, that gender is in their head and it's a way of knowing. And for some people, gender is how they express themselves in the world. So it could include everything from how masculine or feminine you dress, which also has a lot to do with the culture that you're that you're yeah. living in. So it's a whole combination of cues and symbols to try to signify to other people, how do we identify and and how do we want the world to identify us? Yeah. Oprah's always smarter at saying it. I feel like you should just go with that. <laughs> well, <laughs> we asked her to be on the show and she said no. So. No. Um, I think a lot of people are also wondering, and maybe too shy to say it on Facebook, but your name is a very feminine sounding name. You identify as trans and people yes. that have watched the video on Cosmo or whatever know that you've um, at least in some part changed your figure. So mm -hmm. you identify and you use the pronouns they and them. So gender wise, I have one person that asked how many genders are there? So maybe you can say a little oh. bit about that and, and kind of what you would say about yourself in that way, if you feel comfortable doing that. Yeah. I would say that like pronouns can be a lot like, like names, like my mom and people who knew me when I was a little kid have a different name right, for back me on. than church people, right? And so gender can be like that in that people can have have ways they describe their gender to their intimate partner, ways they describe their gender at work, ways they describe their gender to the public as a whole. So I use they, them because I choose as a pastor to keep those details about my private parts private. And yeah. so traditionally don't have conversations about about that. And because I want my focus when I'm doing pastoral care to be caring for other people rather than, um, you know, having, having strong preferences about what my own pronouns are. But I also invite people to practice with me so that people who do really, really deeply emotionally want you to use a particular pronoun at a particular time that, that sometimes if you can practice with folk who it doesn't injure them, it will help it be easier when you're with people who do feel so injured. So we can put our finger on mouth of you. So 100%. That, yeah. Um, I do want to go back. So Dr. Gagnon, I think where we lost you, you were talking about um, self, uh, like looking at the Bible versus your so, sort of self-identification of what you think is true about these things. That's a really big overarching statement, but does that help you figure out where we lost you? Yes, there, there are different hermeneutical priorities in the church. That is how we interpret the biblical text or how we actually apply what we think the will of God is to our lives. And sometimes people operate with experience as the most important element. But I would argue that that's not the historic understanding of the church. The historic understanding of the church is at the top is scripture the direct revelation of God that is given. Uh, the consistent witness given in ethical and scientific, and then experience would be last because experience isn't self-interpreting. Uh, you find the uh, lens through which to interpret experience in the direct revelation of God in scripture. And there is indeed a consistent witness on human sexual ethics in scripture.
the sexual binary is sacred to God in scripture. Um, Megan started by talking about my view of Genesis. Let me clarify a little bit. Uh, Genesis describes the creation of woman by using a Hebrew word, selah, which is frequently translated rib, out of which she forms a woman. And extraction is made from the man, creating a missing element in the man, uh, thus creating him as a gender-specific man. Previously to this point, he's just called a human. And Adam is the Hebrew term, not being used as a proper name. And then once this woman is created from this Selah, which I think is better interpreted side, uh, then the gender specific terms of Ish, man, and Ishar, woman, are then used retroactively. Uh oh. Uh -oh. I say side because this Hebrew word Selah, everywhere else, one exception used for the side of the Ark of the Covenant of the, or the Solomonic Temple or the eschatological temple in Ezekiel. Hmm. Um, and one of, only once is it used for the side of a hill. Everywhere else it's used for a side of a piece of sacral architecture. And it's a way of saying that God's creation of man and woman is sacral architecture to God. It's something holy to God. We see Jesus making an appeal to this in Mark 10, parallel in Matthew 19. Jesus is dealing with the question of the number of allowable partners in a sexual union, whether serially in divorce and remarriage for any cause or implicitly concurrently in a polyamorous union or in those days, a polygamous union. Now, because there was never polyandry, there never existed the opportunity for multiple husbands by wives. Uh, the exception was only given to men. Uh, women operated on their monogamy principle. Men did not. Jesus revoked that license that's given to men. And hmm. why? how did he revoke it? He revoked it by an appeal to the two key creation texts in Genesis 1 and 2. Male and female, he created them, citing only one-third of Genesis 1. 27 and therefore and, and next to it Genesis 224 which begins with a therefore which is a way of saying that the therefore is found in Genesis 127 because God created us as male and female as a complementary sexual pair designed for sexual union therefore a man may become joined to a woman and the two, and only the two become one flesh. Now, it's interesting that he says the two because the two is not actually in the Hebrew text of Genesis 2.24. It's in all the versional evidence. It's in uh, the Greek translation. It's in the uh, Samaritan uh, Pentateuch. It's in the Aramaic Targums. It's in the Vulgate, but it's not in the Hebrew text. Of the sexual binary sexual creation designed by God. And he's because God intentionally created humans as a complementary sexual pair, male and female, such that the two halves of the sexual spectrum unite to form a single sexual whole. A third party or more is neither necessary nor desirable. Because once you join together a male and a female, a man and a woman, the two halves of the sexual spectrum are already united. An integrated sexual whole is already created. So what Jesus is saying of sexual ethics is God's intentional creation of a male and a female for sexual pairing. And it's the binary character of human sexuality that for Jesus is the foundation for limiting the number of partners in a sexual union to two, whether at any one time or serially. Now, that means that polyamory, as bad as that may be, is not as bad as the rejection of the foundation upon which a monogamy principle is predicated. So the, the binary element of human sexuality 
male and female is critical for Jesus, absolutely critical. In addition to that, we can also see a correlation with the question of adult consensual incest as another parallel. Why not allow only if they allow uh, birth, if birth control is used in the process? Because there's too much identity on the part of the participants, too much formal identity in terms of kinship, not enough kinship otherness. There's even more identity felt in a same-sex union. Same-sex unions are essentially a rejection, a partial rejection of an individual's biological sexual identity regarding somebody of the same sex, not somebody of the other sex, to be one's complementary half. If the logic of a heterosexual union is two halves of the sexual spectrum unite to form a single sexual whole, the logic of a homosexual union is that two half males become a whole male, two half females become a whole female. It's a misunderstanding about one's sexual identity, that one is not whole in one's maleness or in one's femaleness, needing to be supplemented by a person of the same sex as if their own sexual identity was incomplete. Hmm. Transgenderism is even more radical. Transgenderism is a complete rejection of one's birth sex. Not a statement that I'm only half my own sex, but a statement that I'm not even my own birth sex. And from the standpoint of scripture, that's a denial of God's work as creator. And it is regarded as nothing less than blasphemous. That's why in Deuteronomy 22.5, it's very clear that cross-dressing is abhorrent to God because cross-dressing illustrates a view of one's gender identity that is at odds with one's biological reality. The word used there is tovah. It's an abomination. It's something revolting to God. Mm. Now, they knew in the ancient world about persons who did identify, if you will, as transgender in the ancient Near East and in the Greco-Roman Mediterranean basin. Mm. Ancient Israelites, early Jews, and early Christians were not unaware of this phenomenon. They were quite aware of it. They're designated by different uh, terms in the ancient Near East, Kugaru, Alulu, etc. Uh, in the Hebrew Bible, they're called the Kadashim, which refers to men who believe that they're consecrated to an androgynous deity and thereby emasculate themselves, remove their marks of masculinity, and have sex with other men as females. Paul uses a similar term. And by the way, that those figures to historian is also committing an abomination. The same term, something revolting or abhorrent to God. The same term that's used with respect to homosexual practice in Leviticus 18.22 and 20.13. And when Paul discusses in his vice or offender list in 1 Corinthians 6.9, of a group, groups of persons who, by virtue of their self-affirming sinful behavior, are going to be excluded from God's kingdom. He includes not only men who lie with a male, which is actually a quotation, a virtual quotation from Leviticus 18, 22, and 2013. It's the term that does not appear in the Greco-Roman milieu. It appears only in early Judeans. And in, in addition to that term, arsenal koitai, is the term malakoi. Soft men, Latin would be mollus, same term, same meaning. And it applies to men who actively feminize themselves, removing the marks of masculinity to, again, attract male sex partners. They Dr. too Dr. are not as being excluded from God's kingdom. Dr. Gagnon, I hate to jump in, but we do want to try to have equal time. And I'm I'm keeping general time for the sake of the podcast, but I wasn't timing each of you, but um, I wanted to keep those opening remarks somewhat the same. So um, 
So I, pro- I apologize for jumping in, but I want to make sure Megan has equal time. So Megan, maybe take a few minutes to to come back. And I might say as well, Dr. Gagnon, that you might, because you're still kind of coming in and out a little bit. So you, what you might do is stop the video. It'd keep you on the call, but you you're, wouldn't use bandwidth for the video. So that's a suggestion. Oh, However, okay. that would mean that we can't see you, but you can see us. And uh, I would be comfortable with that, but I'd, I don't know if everyone else would be, but just a suggestion I for- this guy. A lot of people on Facebook are not very happy with him freezing up. They're like, come on, he's our guy. Like, let's hear his <laughs> whole argument. So, so in the bottom left, uh, Dr. Gagnon, it just says stop video. And if you just click on that, it'll just, it'll your your, your name or, or whatever will pop up. And then, but you should be able to see us and still interact. So Megan, maybe a few minutes coming back on some of the sure. things he said in particular, I think, you know, he did talk about uh, Tel Aviv, uh, you know, the abomination that God understands- the the some of these things and he did use the word blasphemy so maybe coming back on that uh well i i guess the way that i would say it is that i just want to remind people the majority of what he just spoke about is about sexuality which is a different topic um and and so what i want to focus us on is is transgender issues and and i know that that the the belief that transness is more extreme or or as the way i would say it colloquially like it's more you gross than other stuff that we could imagine that people could do with their bodies. Um, it's didn't really talk about any of the stuff like rock of my soul at the bosom of Abraham. Like it's, that's still a part of our theological pattern as well. You can, you can have Greek words like Malakoi and bring them up. Uh, what, what Dr. Gagnon knows is that it's only used four times in Paul's writings. Every other time it's used to describe fabric as soft. So presuming it's about a whole group of people and means a specific thing. I could as easily argue that a soft man is someone who's overweight, right? Huh. Because there's no other cross-references for it. And mm-hmm. I'm sure Dr. Gagnon will, could cite a million things about it. But again, it's about sexuality. It's not about the issue at hand, which is transgender issues. Huh. And it also leaves out the fact that many things that Jesus changes on, right? He said, he talks about how Jesus comes to a more strict idea of sexuality. I I couldn't tell you exactly what Jesus's sexual ethic is because my experience is that Jesus asks a lot of questions to make us wonder, Hmm. to make us less judgy of our neighbor. Uh, Matthew, Matthew says, the measurement we use on other people is the measurement God will use on us in judgment. So if people want to have a very specific way they judge other people, that's cool. But I'm going to be allowing God to do those kinds of judgments. I don't know what it means when Jesus poses this question to people who uphold the law above um, the freedom of Christ. When Jesus says the sex workers will go ahead of you in heaven. I don't know what that means for Jesus's sex ethic, but it would be a question I would pose back. Not, Not because I have a stance on sexuality, again, not the topic, but because sometimes Jesus asks questions in hopes that we'll love more people, love the Gentiles, even though they weren't a part of the promise in Deuteronomy. I think, look to the book of Acts, the Ethiopian eunuch known to be a trans person during that time period. Traditionally through the the way that Deuteronomy was read, eunuchs were not allowed to go in the holiest places in the temple, but he encounters a disciple of God And he says another question meant to evoke, what is to prevent me from being baptized? Mm -hmm. And they stop and he gets baptized, right? And so know that sometimes God's saving actions happen regardless of whether or not we understand them. Jesus says there are more people who are part of my flock than are in this household And so I believe that if God says people are saved, that God has the ability to do that. And I'm not willing to call God a liar. And so if if Jesus says, eat these, eat this bread, drink this cup, uh, there is only one baptism for the forgiveness of all of my sins. If Paul says these divisions don't matter anymore, no more Jew nor Greek, no more no more um, Gentile, nor Jew, nor slave, nor free, male and female, right? Again, Paul gets it. If these divisions are erased by Christ dying on the cross, I'm not certain why they're as important as they are to Dr. Gagnon. And that would be the question I would pose back. Why has being against a group of people 
been worth 20 years of study in your life? Mm. What is it that is what brings your passion to this subject? And so that would be the question I offer back. Dr. Gagnon, are you still with us? Can you hear I am. us? I am. Yeah. There's a, a lot that I would like to respond to because there's a lot that's been said here. Uh, and wait, before you go, Dr. Gagnon, I want to just put out there, various people are wondering if you will react, maybe you're already planning on this, but to Megan's assertion about uh, like circumcision and the transfiguration piece. So I want to put that on your radar to react to that if you didn't already plan to. Yes, at the beginning, a number of things here to address quickly. Yeah. Megan said that I said that transgender people are people outside of God's law. That's absolutely false. Hmm. God's love is designed to reclaim us for his kingdom. Amen. Not for ourselves to continue to live by our own internal desires about what we think is right, but rather to confirm form our lives in a cruciform, cross-centered existence to what God's will is for our life, not our will for ourselves. I don't get that pass. She doesn't get that pass. Nobody gets that pass. That's why Jesus defines discipleship, again, as losing your life, taking up your cross, denying yourself, not getting what you want, but denying yourself. We're all under that stricture, not just her, but all of us are under that. She argued that there is certain pronouns, uh, like female pronouns applied to men or male pronouns applied to females in the Hebrew Bible, citing this Rabbi Samet. I actually have an article on that, um, on this article in the New York Times, rebutting that. Uh, Samet doesn't seem to understand, and it would be, his conclusions would be rejected by all biblical scholars, that there are what we call orthographic variants in the Hebrew Bible, that is spelling deviations in earlier and later periods of the Hebrew text. And the difference between a Hebrew pronoun who and a Hebrew pronoun he, the former being uh, who being he and he ironically being she, is the use of a vowel uh, sign, which at the earliest stages is more limited and uses much more generic who, which means not just he, but any individual, whether he or she. Only at later stages did that vowel sign get specifically pointed as female. So what Samet attributes to an approval of transgenderism is nothing but orthographic variations in the biblical manuscript at earlier stages. All biblical Hebrew scholars know that. No exceptions anywhere among an actual professor of Old Testament or Hebrew Bible. There's no dissenting point of view on that issue. Um, circumcision is doing something, yes, to the male member, but it's not changing the male member. It's not changing the man into a woman. It's merely being used as a sign of putting off fleshly desires to seek the will of God in our life so that even our sexual desires are subjugated to the will of God. It actually indicates the exact opposite of what Megan is saying, not a license to do what you want consistent with whatever your innate urges are, but the exact opposite, that your will, including your will about your sexual life, will be subordinated to God's demands, quite unlike what we have going on in the ancient Near East generally. And that's why the understanding of sexual purity in the Hebrew Bible is much more carefully circumscribed than any else, anywhere else that we find in the ancient Near East or in the Greco-Roman milieu at a later time. So she's reading it exactly opposite from the way the text reads it. Let's look at eunuchs. She talked about eunuchs as being a, a preliminary to accepting transgenderism. Quite the contrary. Eunuchs that are discussed in the Isaiah text that she referred to, or the Ethiopian eunuch in Acts 8, these are persons that are made eunuchs. They are not persons who are seeking to erase the marks of their masculinity. They rather had it done to them. In fact, in Isaiah 39, it makes that very point that they are not at fault precisely because it was done to them rather than they doing it to themselves. So all that Isaiah is saying is, why should they be penalized if it's something if it was something that was forced on them rather than undertaken by their own initiative? When Jesus talks about eunuchs, 
in his statement in Matthew 19, which is right after his statement insisting, by the way, she talked about, Megan talked about me only talking about sexuality and not transgenderism. She's missing the whole point. Jesus's demarcation of a male-female requirement for sexual ethics based on biology is absolutely foundational to his entire understanding of human sexual ethics. That's what both homosexuality and transgenderism attack at its root, that that should not be the foundation of sexual ethics. But Jesus actually premised all other sexual ethics standards on that foundation. For him, that indicates that's absolutely critical for him in terms of defining human sexual ethics. It is the underpinning to all sexual ethics, not just transgenderism, not just homosexuality, but also polyamory, also incest, and all other pro and adultery and all other prohibitions of sexual immorality. So she's trying to say it's too general, doesn't apply here. What I'm saying is it's general because it applies to all sexual ethics, especially this because it's homosexual practice and transgenderism alone that attack the root, the very foundation of what Jesus says is central to all sexual ethics. Okay, and let's 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 let Megan come back. I mean, a, a couple of thoughts, Megan. I mean, w- one is kind of maybe bigger bigger picture, and one is is more um, specific. The the unit question is one that that comes up a lot in all of these conversations. It's especially in the New Testament. It strikes. It comes up again and again. It's kind of the best evidence for or they're not being a gender binary or, or what have you. And part of what Dr. Gagnon was saying was that that was something sort of forced upon him. I'd, I'd be curious to response for that. That's the smaller question. I think the bigger question, though, is frequently in these conversations, you do hear Galatians 3, 28-sided, you know, neither male, male nor female. So, and, and so there, in that context, it's really about, say, justification. It's about, you know, how are we, we are seen in God's eyes. Do you think it's fair to extrapolate the fact that God's justification is you know, for all people to then equate an equality of something like gender? Or is that, I mean, is that, I mean, I I guess you do think that's a fair way of understanding the scripture. I mean, I, I guess I think maybe the difficulty that is between our two positions is that we disagree on what's interpretation, what's a theological reading of the scripture and what's there. Right. And so, um, If you already believe Jesus believes this thing, you see it there in that text. Isn't it obvious that it's there? And both both of us have that inclination. It's it's just part of our lens of how we see the world. Um, When it when it comes to experience as a parent, I I try to just take parenting advice from other parents. Right. And when it comes to sexuality, um, if your number one advice on how to be a sexually ethical person is from someone based in celibacy, it's hard to know how to take that. You take marriage advice from someone who's married, right? And so um, not knowing Dr. Gagnon's place in the world, it's hard to know where the expertise is coming from or this advice is coming from. Um, in, in conversations about eunuchs, there was a wide diversity of, of ways and reasons that people became eunuchs, some by choice, um, some on purpose, um, some through parental choices. It's it's really diverse. There's no description in Acts about why the Ethiopian eunuch became a eunuch, only that they were one and that they're sacred now through baptism. And so, you know, you can take that for what it is. I think there are a number of places where um, discipleship is called for that we do hard things. And and this is not me. If there's one thing that comes from this, it should be saying that I too believe that there are things that we do because we follow and love God, right? Mm-hmm. I'm married to one person. I have two children, right? I, I make personal decisions about my private parts that I would not encourage other people to make about their private parts, right? Our bodies are something that are sacred. We were each knit together individually in our wombs, God says, right? And and Paul says something that I think is very helpful for this conversation. Paul says, nothing is unnatural in, in, in and of itself. It is only made unnatural by those who think it is unnatural. Paul believes that some people can choose not to eat meat. Paul believes some people can choose circumcision. Other people can choose not to have circumcision. 
this is not a conversation of me saying Dr. Gagnon should do something that is not natural for him. Um, but it is a conversation wondering why Dr. Gagnon thinks that his interpretation can tell other people what is natural for them. And so I err on the side of, of Jesus's metaphor, let the weeds and the wheat lie together, right? Let God be the one who figures out who is doing the right, just thing. Does that mean that I don't live my personal ethic? Does that mean if God is calling me to do something, I do something else and instead I go, right? take on every bodily craving that I have? No, I, I think more like Dietrich Bonhoeffer, which is that each of us is individually to discern what God is calling us to do. Not everybody was called to be swallowed by a whale. Jonah was. And by the way, that fish starts off male and becomes female. What? Later in the book, that's right. And, and I would like to err on the side of assuming that the Bible the way that it's written is sacred. Dr. Gagnon can say that there's spelling errors in it, perhaps. But um, I believe that the scripture is sacred if only proven by the fact that Dr. Gagnon and I have the same book that names us and claims us. The same book nurtures our faith. The same book shows us that God is our God. And mm -hmm. that's a beautiful thing that, that I will celebrate. Dr. Gadnon, can I go back to a very foundational text? And because well, I think before that before you do that, may yeah. I actually respond to some of the things that were mm -hmm. said here? Uh, as you mentioned, the Galatians three twenty eight text, neither male and female. Even William Loder, a New Testament scholar who's written more books on sexual ethics in early Judaism and early Christianity than anybody else, about eight or nine of them, who's thoroughly affirming of gay marriage and transgenderism. Even he acknowledges that Galatians 3.28 is not a window for affirmation of these behaviors for Paul. That all Paul is saying by neither male and female is that men and women have equal worth before God. That's it. We actually know that there were heretics in Paul's day, including at Corinth, and Gnostics later, who actually interpreted that with regard to sexual behavior, and even they understood that if it was applied to sexual behavior, it would mean no sex, asceticism. And the church fathers who responded to them, even though they disagreed with their application, said that's right, in the kingdom of God, when this does apply fully to sexual behaviors as well, then it means no sexual behavior at all. So if that's how you want to apply it, then it would mean complete asceticism from any sexual behavior, because Jesus's view is, so long as we have these biological bodies in this realm, there is legitimate distinction between male and female that must be upheld because men are not women, women are not men. And when you put men and women together, the extremes of each sex are moderated and the gaps in the sexual self are filled. When you put two women together or two men together, or if it ends up that way with a woman who identifies as a man and is having relations with a woman, but it's really a woman, still basically a lesbian relationship, the extremes are not moderated and the gaps are not filled. Men and women are not interchangeable. I'm sorry if I shocked anyone by that statement. That is a radical statement. Men and women are different. And they're different in ways that complement each other so that the extremes can be moderated and the gaps can be filled. We do know that the eunuch uh, from Ethiopia was castrated. That's what happens. That's the, that's the overwhelming situation that takes place in Ethiopia for those who work for the queen is they are castrated. We also know, have various Jewish texts from early Judaism saying that eunuchs, if they're to be part of God's kingdom, are not to engage in sex, sexual behavior, and are to maintain God's commandments by not cross-dressing. That's the, that's the overwhelming view in early Judaism. So there's no, there's no question of taking the eunuch text as affirmation of transgenderism. There is no biblical text that supports transgenderism. Not only is there no biblical text, but it's regarded as extreme sacrilege, abhorrent to God to do it. That's a clear and consistent witness throughout the canon of scripture. There is no alternative voice to that. So when Megan talks about, well, we just have different ways of interpreting the text. 
Of course, we all have different ways of interpreting the text. That's why I wrote a 500 page book to deal with the counter arguments having to do with it, right? Anyone can make any argument they want, they want to make, but the question is, can you adequately defend it in light of the evidence? She talked about judgment. Gee, this is not about judgment. And she cited a text from Matthew 7 about not judging. Guess what? In Matthew's gospel, there are more judgment words from Jesus than in any other gospel by far. So obviously, that's not how Matthew interprets the don't judge text. What Matthew understands Jesus to be saying by don't judge is don't judge hypocritically and don't major in minors. Be aware that you too are a sinner and in need of repentance. But if you want to love somebody, and this, this is a text from the Old Testament that Jesus appeals to, Leviticus 19, 18, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. What is the context for that? If you, you're, if you shall not hate your neighbor, you shall not hold a grudge against your neighbor. And if your neighbor does wrong, you shall reprove your neighbor, lest you inc incur guilt for failing to warn them. And you will love your neighbor as yourself. That's why when Jesus talks about sin of your neighbor in Leviticus 17, he says, if your neighbor is sinning, rebuke him so that he can be reclaimed for the kingdom of God. It's the whole reason why the summary of Jesus's message about the coming kingdom, according to the gospel of Mark, is first repent, turn from your sin to follow God's path as revealed in scripture. Uh, Not, Dr. Jagan, I'm gonna, I'm gonna stop you there for a second. I, um, partly because time is of the essence, partly because I've seen Megan's face squinch so many times. I definitely want to make sure we, we kind of circle back and give you guys each a chance to respond to each other. But I also really want to get to some of the questions from people on Facebook. One of the questions that came up, we talked a little bit about when you were having technical difficulties. So I wanted to make sure we kind of came back to it. The question is about how many genders are there? The idea of this whole podcast is, is the gender binary, are there just two, right? And I know there are people even in the trans world that would say, yes, there are just two. That's why I chose to go from one to the other, right? Like, and then there's some people that say there's over 60. Um, so Dr. Gang and I assume that you think that there are two genders and that's biblical, correct? Yeah, there are two genders, two sexes intentionally designed by God. And you would use those terms uh, interchangeably, sex and gender. Uh, I understand that people make the distinction between sex as your biological reality and gender as the way that you self-present, but the view that scripture would have on it is that your self-presentation should be consistent with your biology, and okay. not to do that is to commit sacrilege. So yes, there are, you know, people talk about other categories like the intersex, yeah, well, but the intersex are not a third sex. I want to hold off on intersex just for a minute. That's a slightly different conversation. Mm -hmm. um, well, not slightly. It's a, it's a much different conversation. But mm -hmm. why don't you finish that thought out that we got paused on earlier about genders and how many are there? Is there some, I mean, there's like the graphic you, when you go on Google and you put in, you know, gender binary, you see like the sort of typically man and typically female and then all the in-betweens. Well, part, the reason why I mentioned the intersex is because that's part of the in-betweens. And okay. what it's essential to establish here is that the intersex do not create a new sex. They are understood to be a disorder of sexual development. Okay, they don't create a new way to reproduce. Um, they don't create a new chromosome. They don't create a new sex hormone. They don't create new types of genitalia. They're rather widely regarded in the medical profession as disorders of sexual development. And okay, let me, what let me, we may have going on with people who identify as transgender is a disorder of sexual development, not- I, I, I have to jump in here because if we don't kind of steer this ship, we're, we're gonna be here all day. Just for those listening that maybe don't know what intersex is, would it be fair to say that intersex people are born with often both male and female genitalia in some capacity? It's what we used to call hermaphroditic, That's and we've right. called it lots of different things, but- well, They may have two X chromosomes with a Y chromosome instead of just an XY, things like that. Right, so- uh, Natur Natural variations that occur- right. But a Y chromosome- Through the way people are born. But a right Y chromosome is essentially, by doctors, they understand that essentially determines a male. Sure. Um, and XX determines a female. Even if it's a double X and a Y, they still essentially understand the individual as male. These are very statistically small uh, yeah. elements of the total population. It would be like taking conjoined twins 
and arguing that therefore we should implode monogamy because you can't bring your other twin outside the room when you're having sex. I okay, mean, I don't want to spend too much time on intersex because you're right, it is a very small portion of the of the world. But Megan, what were you going to say about genders? How many are there? Maybe you don't have a number. Maybe you want to move on and that's fine. We can take another question. No, I think what would be good to say is that there was a lot of rabbinical writings in the oral Torah about Genesis 1 and 2 and about different ways that as God takes this perfect whole and slices it, that the slice isn't the same every time. In the same way that I don't have the same DNA as any of you, um, when God took this perfect whole and sliced it, that sometimes the slice happened differently. And so the early rabbis were talking about people coming back together in holes in ways that didn't always look exactly like Adam and Eve's story. Um, so there is a long-term kind of way of thinking about gender being a multiplied way of describing it. I think what I would do is just, I would say, in the same way that every Christian is going to have a different testimony, every trans person has a different way of describing their body and based on where they live in different parts of the world might use different terms and language for it. My sense is that trans choices are a lot more complicated maybe than most people imagine. Because for the one part, you might have this way you would love your body to look, right? Okay. It, might look like, it might look like Barbie, it might look like Ken, right? But in the real world, if you're having a trans experience, you might honor your fertility for a certain period of your life and withhold when you want to look more like that body of your choice. You might... Um, have want to get married and have a sacred relationship in all the ways that Dr. Gagnon is talking about and just make different choices about your gender journey at different parts of your time span. And I think some people think that you identify as trans and then you do these things and you get it done and they don't always remember that you know, you're, if you're, you're taking your fertility choices very seriously, you're having one set of thoughts about it. If you're taking your, your ro romantic partner's thoughts about your body seriously, you might have another conversation about it. And so it's a very complex way of being embodied. And that's why I kind of, I push back from the, it's like this experience and then like this, because it's so complicated, right? For some people, they don't see procreation as their future. And so they make different choices. And so, um, and if we all live long enough, our body sags and folds and changes in ways that we might or might not be into. But, well, let's, but, let's, let's, but change is constant, is what I would say about our bodies. So. This, this is, first of all, this is mutilation of the body, oftentimes leading to, and when it's taken the full sex reassignment surgery, so called, leads to actual uh, elimination of reproductive capacity. I mean, you really have to go a long way to eliminate the existence of the gendered body that you're born with. And, and you never, it's only at best cosmetic surgery. They can't restore functioning sex organs. Hormones can't be of the other sex, cannot be naturally produced. It's a lifelong taking of pills or injections in order to do that. And that's because the body, it resists this kind of fundamental transformation of it to make it what it is not, the whole skeletal design of the body. And in the end, you're not changing the DNA by one iota. You're not changing an XY to an XX or an XX to an XY. None of that's happened. It's purely cosmetic surface change, but it's a radical reevaluation of the body. You know, it's interesting. And it's all based on a subjective interpretation because I feel this way, therefore I am this. And not only I am this, but you must say that I am this. I mean, earlier she talked about the fact that, uh, you know, we have to let everybody live their own lives. That's not the way the LGBTQ movement works. And every one of us knows that. I've been a victim of the cancel culture of the LGBTQ. I face professional cause for it. I get, I get uh, slandered right and left, including by Megan before we even got on, who called me a biblical scholar where she put scholar in quotation marks even though my degrees are from Dartmouth, Harvard, and Princeton, and even though my work has been widely acclaimed, even by scholars on the other side at Oxford and Vanderbilt and other, other places as legitimate work, 
And she compared, she said she would be civil to me in the same way that she'd been civil in a conversation with a white supremacist. Now, I didn't find that to be flattering. I'm, I'm in an interracial marriage with interracial children. And to declare that I am on an analogy with the white supremacists and then present herself here as being, well, everybody needs to live their own lives and make their own decision. That's not the way it happens. And what I think we need to devote here is some time to discuss what is the ecclesiastical and political cost to bending the knee to the LGBTQ God? Mm. Because there is a huge cost to pay. It isn't live and let live. It's never been live and let live by them. I've been in a mainline denomination, the Presbyterian Church USA. For many years, I debated in the ELCA. By the way, they don't hear all the voices now. The side that I represent, the historic Christian position, you don't hear those voices in debate in an ELCA venue any longer. It's a one-sided presentation. I've given presentations in the Episcopal Church, in the Methodist Church, all across the main denominational lines, and they all have the same argument on the left, on the LGBTQ agenda. Doesn't change no matter what denomination I've been to. Why? Robert, because it's all opposed to biblical text in its context. Dr. Gagnon, I hate to interrupt again, but we do have to, we're, we're going to bring the, the podcast portion of the show to an end. Uh, we we have to do that. We have to bring it to an end at, at, at exactly 58 minutes or so for the podcast radio show purposes. You've been, if you've been listening on the digital uh, output of this uh, through the HD2 channel at KPFT, we want to thank you for listening. Go to kpft.org to learn more about how you can support radio like this. Uh, and if you're listening on the podcast or Facebook Live, what we're going to do, uh, we're going to keep going on Facebook Live. We have a lot to talk about still, a lot of questions unanswered. We can go as long as you guys want. Uh, this will be on YouTube as well in the not so distant future. Uh, but so we want to keep going. But for our radio listeners and podcast listeners, uh, we want to encourage you to question freely, think deeply, and disagree as needed. Uh, disagreement has been needed today. Um, but you know, I, I also came out of a, a a very you know the ELCA, so the Evangelical Lutheran Church in America, where where Megan currently is a pastor, and and so one of the things Megan I would say is as well as that, you know, it, at first the conversation is all about sort of acceptance and then tolerance, but there really is little room anymore for what I would say is a more conservative position. Do you think there's room in? Um, in liberal denominations for a conservative view on this topic. And then there are political ramifications for this as well. Uh, we're seeing, for example, cancel culture is extending to professors with tenure. You either sign on the dotted line here or you'll be out of a job. Uh, and I, we could bring Black Lives Matter into this as well because there's a lot of transgender language within their their belief statement. So do, do, you, do you really believe that all voices really do matter on this question, or is it so wrong that people oppose a more fluid understanding of gender that those voices really have to be silenced? So I think there's, what I, what I would say to that question is that there's a number of ways of thinking of this. In, in God's kingdom, all are welcome. In particular church buildings, sometimes there's rules for safety, like my kids aren't allowed to run through the church. Right. And so, unfortunately, Dr. Gagnon's training at Harvard and Princeton hasn't really kept up with what they're teaching now, which means that in their medical ethics department, they do believe it's compassionate health care to care for trans people in their law department. They believe that trans rights are humans rights. And so I think being someone whose institution is proud of them is as important as being proud of the institution where you studied and that can say some things. Does that mean that people should be canceled? I don't believe it means that people should be canceled, but I know that because I had people try to remove gay demons from my body when I was in South Dakota. The reason I am a pastor today is because people stated some of the most vile things to try to convince me that I should not uh, be who I am. And 
that may feel like loving your neighbor to some people. It may feel like that's following what is asked for in the, in the book of Matthew in terms of like letting someone know when you think you're wrong. But the book of Matthew says, tell them once. It doesn't say tell them for 20 years and make it your life study. The book of Matthew says, then go to another community and tell them your complaint. Because the book of Matthew knows that we might just be holding on to something that we need to learn more about. And so I think it's learning is on every side. LGBTQ folk should not treat people the same way they were treated when the church opposed them and pass on that oppression to new people. We absolutely should not do that. And there's an ongoing conversation. Most, most branches of psychology right now, which is why there is movement across the world to kind of ban reparative therapy, say that language that against trans folk, telling them that they are abominations is harmful, that um, it causes people to consider suicide more often. It leads to depression. Here in San Francisco, where I live, part of the reason I engage in this conversation, 40% of our homeless youth in San Francisco are homeless because they were kicked out of their families, kicked out of faith communities for being who they are. And that also includes the adult population here in San Francisco of people who are LGBTQ. So it, it it's gonna take every side to figure out how to do that. How can people love each other and not do harm to each other? And it's a really difficult thing to figure out I think Jesus was trying to figure out that in conversations with other rabbis, like he was kind of mean to the Pharisees sometimes, right? And he was kind of forgiving to the tax collectors sometimes. We don't know why and how Jesus picked who he was kind of expanding their brain for at any given moment. Um, I hope that we will move towards more civility, um, but I do think it should be said that theologies that are harmful shouldn't be allowed to be shared everywhere. In the same way that I'm not gonna read the text about Abraham slaughtering Isaac to young children who don't understand the context and wonder if they might be next after church. Um, I think there's a time and a place for how you feel about gay people. Going into a sanctuary to tell them how wrong you think they are, instead of focusing on worshiping God, which is what I think a sanctuary is for, it can be just a problematic thing. And so if we had spaces that were safe to have these conversations, I think it would go better. Um, and if there were ways that we could have boundaries when we injure each other or ways to say like, I'm hurting right now, can we take a pause from this conversation? I think that's what we're not really able to do very well. Let me, let me jump in. Christians, yeah. The term harm. And so I think that segues a little bit <clears throat> into one of the questions that a lot of people on here are talking about, by the way, Facebook's got a mind of its own right now. And, and there are people are getting feisty. Yeah. Um, but, and one, uh, just to, to remind you, if you're on Facebook listening if, again, if you have an actual question, not just a comment about my eyes, um, put a cue in front of it so that I know that it's a question because it's rolling so fast. It's hard to keep up when it comes to pronouns. And I want to hear from both you and Dr. Gagnon here. Um, I think there there tend to be, even in the traditional camp of this, kind of two sets of thought, and I'm curious to hear both of your reactions. One side, I think maybe Dr. Gannon falls in this category, would say, I, I'm not going to use a pronoun that doesn't match what I think this person's, uh, you know, natural gender is, because I think that's an affront to God and the way the created order. And then you have uh, other Christians that fall traditionally, but try to honor and respect the person by using the preferred pronouns. Um, so let's talk a little bit about the line between, you know, honoring and respect and, of course, honoring God first and what that might look like when you, Megan, hear somebody like Dr. Gagnon, I mean, he, he's several times used she or her. Uh, do you just kind of chalk that up to, well, that's kind of where he is? Is that, do you consider that harmful? Like, talk a little bit about that. And then I definitely want to hear Dr. Gagnon as well. I don't typically hear it because I have, again, like practiced for a lot of years to make my time in listening to be about listening. So I've been trying to focus on listening to Dr. Gagnon's point and to understand and to open my own perspective. Um, but there are other, a lot of other people, I have a transgender child um, who very much deeply cares about what pronouns are. And so I'm, I have my own learning curve, which is learning about what, what the trans experience is when you're, a, when you're a parent versus a child. And, um, and so I just think it's something that we're all working on as a society. Um, 
I think the thing that I would just encourage people to do is just remember that God changed people's names all the time and then asked people to use those names too. Like having a change is something that happens in the Bible all of the time. Metanoia, this idea of repentance is about total body changing. And, and maybe people want to put it just into do what my naughty and nice list is. Um, but I think total body changing means that there is nothing that God couldn't change about me if God didn't want to change it. And, and just having faith in God that that process works. And for me, it's about loving my neighbor, right? I love my neighbor enough that if they say something that could, could be a slight that I'm going to try to keep loving them through that. So Mm -hmm. Um, when I'm talking about things that are harmful, I think there are some medical communities that do harm, that they do label things like reparative therapy as abusive. They do label things like um, uh, trying to, to require people to live in a way that is not, not working for them as abusive. And there, there have been a number of court cases that have been won on that. There's a number of, of medical stories that have been written on that. It's not biblically centered. So that's not my main focus. My main focus is really just that God is a God who thinks changing and transformation is sacred and that that process is modeled to us in the life, death and resurrection of Jesus. And I'm going to do my best in hopes that others do too. I appreciate that. Uh, Dr. Gagnon, do you want to respond about the pronouns? And then, of course, maybe also the reparative therapy that that Megan's talking about? Yeah, well, she went twice. And so I missed the first element, too. I didn't get to respond to that. But uh, respond away. Respond at will. Yeah. So um, imagine that we're at a place in the church where to say what God doesn't like is now harmful. Hmm. That's an extraordinary statement. Because when God tells us what to do and not do, it's for our best. That harm results from not following what God wants us to do. It doesn't mean it's going to be easy. I've got lots of parts in my life. I'm a, I'm a person beset by sinful desires to do what God doesn't want me to do. But I don't get a pass for them, no matter how ingrained or innate they are. He died for me. Hmm. He gave his life for me. In order that I might live, should I now, having him in my heart, say to him, no, thank you, I'm going to go it my way? Hmm. I mean, that's an extraordinary lack of, that's, that's the antithesis of faith. That's the antithesis of hope. To say that the power of God is, you know, one of Paul's great uh, remembrances, so he cited to the Second Corinthians, when I pray for God to take away a thorn in the flesh away from me. And God's answer was, no, my grace is enough for you. My power will be manifested in the midst of your weakness, not by taking you out of that weakness, because God defines himself as strong enough, loving enough, gracious enough, that knowing him is enough, irrespective of whether your life is going to be easy or not be easy. The Mm -hmm. harm does not come from doing God's will. The harm comes from violating God's will. And Megan and the LGBT crop in the mainline mainline denominations and in the secular realm have no problem with defining what's harmful. Hmm. No problem in defining who's wrong. Even she herself said some some things that just should not be allowed to be said. She has no problem muzzling people who disagree with her and characterizing them as the equivalent of racist. This is this is a cancel culture. I have a friend who just died. Mm -hmm. Two days ago, Mike Adams, because he was a victim of the cancel culture, reviled nationally as a racist, homophobic, sexist bigot until a point where he finally couldn't take it. That cancel culture is real. I've experienced, I've had a, a call by a man who said he would rape me because of my views on the LGBTQ issues. I had an email by another individual who said he would kill me and my family members because of my views on this issue. Now, I I mentioned that not to say, gee, you should feel sorry for me and then discontinue thinking about what God's truth is in the in presented by Jesus and the apostolic witness to him. Not at all. My point is everybody experiences suffering and difficulty. What we are to do is to say the words of God with God. I think that 
Megan has taken a wrong step in her life, but I don't say it out of animosity. I don't say it out of hate. On the contrary, if we didn't say it as a church, then by virtue of what we actually believe and think, it would be hate. Because even though we, even though we know that God says this is not appropriate and could lead to exclusion from the kingdom of God, you said nothing. Why? Because you were afraid about what would happen to you if you said something? or because you didn't like the tension that was involved in saying it, but usually it's self-interested. I don't want to expose myself to ridicule and rejection by others, which is now happening in today's cancel culture. So that we have to be aware of. We get back to the issue about pronouns. The reason why I can't say that a person who is biologically female is male or vice versa is because as I've shown, God regards that as sacrilege. That would be blasphemy towards the creator. It would not only be committing sacrilege, it would be a violation of my conscience. It would set a poor example for the weak who don't understand these issues well. And they'd say, oh, well, look at this. This leader said this. He used, apparently it's not a big deal for him because he used contrasex names for a person who's biologically different. It contributes to the self-deception of the misguided individual, which harms their relationship to God. It effectively gives up the story. It concedes the precise point of disagreement over the question of whether we should endorse transgenderism, namely whether there is such a thing in reality. Can a person really change their sex or should their self-presentation of gender be different from their biological reality? It leads to a society imposing mandatory speech laws and forced indoctrination of children, which leads to children having a higher incidence of homosexual and transgender self-identification. Many children who experience gender dysphoria, 80 to 95% grow up losing that gender dysphoria. If you don't intervene with, with hormone blockers, if you do intervene with those, it becomes a fait accompli. And then almost 100% of the time, they end up identifying as transgender. So this, she talks about this issue about the reparative therapy, like there's some sort of strange thing about change. Lisa Diamond, thoroughly supportive of lesbianism, homosexuality, transgenderism, notes that there's a great deal of fluidity in sexual orientation, even apart from therapeutic intervention. The Kinsey Institute, thoroughly affirming of the whole LGBTQ agenda, says the vast majority of people who identify as lesbian or gay will experience at least one to two shifts along the Kinsey spectrum from zero to six in the course of life, even without any therapeutic intervention. So there's no question that people do change. I mean, question, another question to uh, Megan would be, how many times can you change your gender identity? If it's all subjective, what is it, only a decade? Once in a decade I'm allowed? Or is it once a year? Or is it once a month, once a week, or every day? Can I change it any amount of times? It shows the, the absurdity of completely disconnecting your self-presentation from your biological reality. If there's such fluidity, and if gender is a social construct, as the LGBTQ movement claims, then what's their problem with a person wanting to undergo not wanting to give in to desires that they feel are at odds with their biologically gendered body, which sends a message about the way they ought to behave. You know, earlier Megan talked about nature used by Paul, it just means an individual's nature. That's absolutely not the case. We have parallel texts, not only in early Judaism, but even by Greco Roman moralists and physicians who use nature to refer to the biological differentiation of male and female, anatomy, physiology, and psychology, all arising from that. Let me, let me jump in. By nature, just whatever you think is right for you. He means that there is a gendered reality that's observable in the material structures of creation. And when you disregard those material structures of creation, you have fundamentally rejected the creator. That is setting you on a bad path and for the church to say, oh, I'm okay, you're okay, when the LGBTQ movement never practices what they preach on that, including Megan, then we're not doing 
uh, justice to love. Okay, let me let me jump in. Let, let me jump in, uh, Megan. There's a lot to respond to there, and you you can feel free to do that. I had a question though. I I wanted to ask you, sort of how how deep would you so gen would you say gender goes? And it's kind of related to what I think Dr. Gadnon was saying. Is it at the cellular level? Is it um, you know we've talked about sort of private parts. Is that it? Um, and I, I do think about that. And this maybe gets more into social territory than we might want to go. But I think about, for example, trans uh, a, a transgendered uh, man uh, competing in a, a woman's bicycling contest uh, whose bones and muscle structure is different or wrestlers uh, who are transgendered who have an obvious strength advantage. I mean, I would say they have an obvious strength advantage. And again, that's maybe more social than we want to go. This is more theological. But um, this is what I think has people concerned, is that if we can't say that men and women are different, why would women compete in sports, for example, if they physically can't compete? And so is gender something that is, again, at the very cellular level of of a human person, or is it only what's in their mind, or is it only at the at the genitalia level yeah i i would let medical people answer medical answers um i'm a pastor so i'll talk about uh gender being at the spiritual level okay. right and and this idea that god knows us and names us and claims us declares us good in the ways that we are the ways that we will be in the ways that we will um, be when we get into that great beyond and and join jesus there is a fear factor that I think needs to be addressed, right? There are people who say, well, if, we, if we're if we okay with this, what if people do bad things in bathrooms? What if people do things to try to cheat at sports? What if people try to rob banks? I think we can all agree we're against bad things being done in bathrooms. We're bad. Maybe you're okay with robbing banks, but like, right, <laughs> we're we're all against people doing terrible things for the sake of terrible things. I I think most of us know that God wants us to try to live and do justice and to to be merciful people in the world, right? So taking off that page of fears of what could really go haywire, um, I think there there is a need to just say, most of us have hormonal changes in our life twice, right? We go through puberty, most of us with our peers. And then there's a pause in our 45 to maybe a little bit, little bit later-ish time where men and women, their hormones shift a little bit and our bodies start to adjust in the ways that we are in the world changes. Trans people have those hormonal shifts out of sync with their peers. They still are having two of those hormonal shifts they just maybe don't wait till they're 45 for it to adjust a little bit, or they might um, delay with with puberty blockers, that first puberty that's happening until they can really make a decision, right? I said, some of these decisions about trans stuff involve fertility, right? So, So you're not delaying puberty for the goal of making a trans person, but because sometimes at age 12, you don't wanna choose if you're gonna have a baby for the rest of your life. And so, I, and I also think we all agree that people that like the choice I make with my body is not something I'm advocating anyone else in the world makes for their body, right? If we assume trans people are centered in God and that their true desire is to have faith in God, I think the question is, should they deny their flesh and take up their cross, right? Is not being trans a take up your cross moment? Or is um, being trans one of the many ways that people are kind of on the outskirts or the margins, right? Matthew 25 says that when we see naked people, we clothe them, that when we see hungry people, we feed them, that we don't ask questions about their status in between before we choose to do that. And so what I think is that if, if we could find a way to have a conversation about trans people who are interested in loving God, that conversation would be a radically different conversation than if it was about all the possible things that could go wrong, um, that also go wrong for non-trans people. And the question I think maybe becomes, can you screw up 
God's salvation of you, right? And that's not a question about just transness. That question could be about who you choose to marry. That question could be about where you choose to live, what kind of politics you have. Can you screw up God's salvation? I don't think you can, um, because I believe in John 3, 17. Jesus came to the world not to condemn it, but to save it. And so that I think is a very, a much narrower, a much more narrow look at where our agreements are and where our differences are. But, um, but I understand the fears and I just want to say like, I don't want any of that bad stuff to happen either. And if I can work with people who even have radically different theologies to make sure bad stuff never happens in bathrooms and people don't cheat at sports, like let's work together on those things. Maybe we can find a language that is a middle place. Um, but I don't, I don't think most people are interested in thwarting yeah. the world. Some people are, but most are not. Megan, Megan talked about John 317 as saying that, you know, you don't have, you can do whatever you want and you don't have to worry about the outcome at the end. Actually, if you read John 317 in context, Jesus is warning that if you don't receive me and my will for your life, then you will remain in the darkness that you're in, condemned. So you actually have to read in context. And this is my repeated problem with the arguments that uh, Megan has tried to make from scripture. She doesn't read texts in their historical and literary context. And when she's confronted by that, she tries to change the issue. She tries to say that, for example, that Jesus was really hadn't made up his mind about the issue of uh, gender dimorphism and that this was still something he was working out. Quite the contrary. Again, he makes a male-female prerequisite for human sexuality the foundation of all human sexual ethics. If you believe anything that Jesus said, please believe this. The question is whether or not you think, because you call Jesus as Lord, there's some sort of implication there of whether or not you have to actually agree with Jesus. Mm. And when Jesus says something important, this is foundational to human sexual ethics. You do not as a, have a right as a believer to say, no, I'm going to go my own way and still call Jesus Lord at the end of the day. What do we think this is? Some sort of game? I'll just call Jesus my Lord, but and I'll continue to live as I want to live, irrespective about what he thinks is important. That is not a good look, either for an individual self-professed believer or for the church as a whole. And in terms of the broader question that you raised about the questions of the dangers of the transgender movement, think about compulsory speech laws. Already in New York City, you can be fined for up to, it's like $125,000 or more if you, quote unquote, misgenders somebody. That is extraordinary. And these compulsory speech laws are being enacted in the workplace. Again, Megan tries to, she obfuscates the issue. She says it's all about everybody living a the life they think is best for themselves. But if you don't use the words they want you to use, in time, you're going to get fired. In Canada, parents who have children who self-identify as the other sex, at least in one province of Canada, I think it was the British Columbia Supreme Court, I'll have to double check that, ruled that if the father did not call his daughter by masculine pronouns and a masculine name, state social services would remove her from the family. The parent of a child, mm -hmm. can you think of anything more invasive by the state than that? We have men invading women's spaces, locker rooms, dressing rooms, restrooms, showers, sports, shelters, prisons. I mean, it's extraordinary the invasiveness that's involved here. Christian colleges face punitive measures. Now, maybe they'll say you can develop your own policy, but if you're going to develop a discriminatory policy, you're not going to receive federal funding, not in terms of financial aid, not in terms of science grants, and eventually we're going to get you on accreditation. So okay. where we're headed is the complete destruction of evangelical Christian education. And Interesting think of that the trans school. people should take up think their the, cost, but Christian think, institutions should, should not Think of the penalties. forced indoctrination of children on a regular basis. Well, you can't even anymore divide the class for sports or activities into girls and boys, because that's already discriminatory. Dr. Gagnon, let me 
Uh, Children Megan wanted to into an ideology to identify as transgender or at least consider that option. Puberty blockers then create a fate accompli. Adolescents, adolescents are allowed sex mutilation surgery that leads to sterilization. The issues that we're facing here are not minor. They're major and they, they affect the entire society at every Megan, level. Church, Megan, they, Megan wanted to say something. I would, uh, Megan, come back on that. Yeah, I just think if if trans people are required by Dr. Gagnon to take off their cross and um, suffer for Christ and do the right thing, then I don't understand why it is a burden or unexpected that Christians who are following their belief that being trans is wrong shouldn't also have a cost that comes with their call carrying the cross, right? And so I think it's it's disingenuous to to equate um things that that's that show that it it causes a loss of life that it causes a lot of um that princeton and harvard at least would say causes um emotional distress and is unnecessary causes physical distress and is, and is unnecessary so i think the standard of taking up your cross and having some consequences should apply to everyone and um and it's something that you know, you can be frustrated when the cross has a cost, but that's kind of how it is, I think. And I think, again, just everyone's trying to live faithfully. This this idea that trans people are all not trying to be following God. I, I've never met that person, but if I meet them, Dr. Gagnon, I promise I will advise them in following the ways of the cross. Let me, let me jump in here because we told Facebook listeners we would lob up their questions and we've only done a couple. We're not gonna get to them all because we are gonna have to wrap this up soon. But let me ask one, maybe two, and then I think we'll need to wrap up. The question is for Megan, after you answer it, Dr. Gagnon, if you wanna you know, respond, I would love that. But the question is to Megan, and there's a word in here that I know I'm not supposed to say, but I'm gonna read the question. Observed. Says Megan. Permission to read the question, yeah. Thank you. Okay, mm -hmm. Megan. You just said that this was a while back that biblical metanoia or repentance is about total body changing. Mm -hmm. You are using this understanding to make the case that transgenderism can be made holy before God. Can you show us biblically how you make the leap from the Bible's concept of repentance to the radical physiological and biochemical changes entailed in transgenderism? Sure. Yeah. Um, and this goes back to the 17 transgender folk that I told you appear in the Catholic Saints calendar. Um, so, so there is actually a reason, uh, that, I mean, thank goodness it's in, not in the radio part, but this is the, the afterwards part. And, and Dr. Gagnon can tell you more about this because it's because of an ancient Greek word play. Um, Aristotle writes about it as well. The ancient Greek word for water, if you take the ancient Greek word for spirit and you put them together, you get the ancient Greek word for sperm. So this idea that you were literally born again in your baptism, in some ancient texts, meant that they believed everyone became male through their baptism and being born again. Because there was this argument, if only male minds can know God and be saved, then surely in baptism, if even women can be saved, then they are being born again in this new way. Is it literally trans? No, but it was read that way by some people. The Acts of Paul and Thecla is one example. A woman followed Paul, who cut her hair like a man's and started wearing men's clothing and was named such a vibrant preacher in the early church that they're a saint. There are 17 of these saints, people who literally believed that they were metanoia, that they were changed in bodily through being born again. So literally, trans people, be born again, right? There is a lot of early Christian references to this idea that being born again means that you are born into people who are faithful to God, that in the same way that your past afflictions and sexuality are washed away by the blood of the lamb, all of these differences and changes are made beautiful and perfect in the loving eyes of God. And again, I'm not saying anything goes. What I'm saying is that there are people who didn't wash their hands enough that ancient rabbis believed couldn't be loved by God because they didn't wash their hands enough 
that standard changed, right? There were people who had sexuality in ways that was outside of the norm. And still the woman at the well got to be a part of Jesus's vision. Sometimes God's love is bigger than we can figure out. And so I hope people will spend as much time trying to figure out why God loves someone like me as they've spent studying why God couldn't possibly love someone like me. Dr. Gagnon, yeah. Yeah. Come back on the, on the, on the question of repentance. And I, and I think that the big picture still is, is something like how big is God's love or how, how big can God's love be? What are the limits or boundaries of God's love on a question like this? And metanoia might have something to do with that. Well, God's love is so big that God wants us to change, to change into the image of Jesus Christ by any means necessary. That's how big God's love is. When Paul addresses in Romans 6 the whole question of why not sin, it ends with, because if you continue to live in conformity to sin operating in the human flesh, this is Romans 8, 14 to 15, you will perish. Only those who are led by the Spirit of God are the children of God. Merely mouthing a few words of confession is insufficient. Your life actually must conform to Christ in you. And that means moving with the Spirit. I mean, Megan went on with such a rambling presentation of what the biblical text says. I can understand why she likes to avoid actual exegesis in its biblical and historical context, because that I've never heard anything so convoluted in my life. Repentance is always a change of mind to move in the direction of God's will for your life, not causing God to rubber stamp whatever you determine you must do. God is not made in our image. We are made in God's image, and we are being remade in the image of Christ by being born again. Born again to do what? What we want to do? No. Take up your cross, lose your life, deny yourself, and come follow me. That's what he's talking about. Megan somehow devolved from that onto everyone becoming male. I'm Unbelievable. At Corinth, there are actually eschatological women who took that advice and were trying to remove the marks of femininity from themselves. And Paul rebuked hey. that. Rebuked that is wrong. We have a Gnostic text, the Gospel of Thomas, that ends with women claiming we shall become male. That's a misogynist view of things. Hey. That's a Gnostic view of things that's rejected by the early church, which values womanhood and values manhood and not the obliteration of it in one's personal biology. Uh, repentance is about change of life in the direction of God. It's not about any change you want to make and have God rubber stamp it. Suppose I'm a polyamorous, as most men are. They don't experience high psychic discomfort over having urges for more than one beautiful woman concurrently. I'm sorry to reveal a state secret by men, but there it is. It's actually true for many men and a problem that men have to deal with. What did Jesus do with that? He threw out an adultery of the heart statement, which effectively said, I don't care what special problems men have in terms of managing their impulses to be monogamous. We are not, bio we are not persons who are biological robots to our impulses. God has created us for his purposes. And to attempt to erase that objective creation as male and female is, again, a denial of the creator, a point of sacrilege. It is self-idolatry. That's how the entire early church would understand it. No exceptions. The text is not ambiguous about that. Jesus is not ambiguous about that. It's just that Megan has to obscure the issue by pointing here and there to things which actually can't even be substantiated from an historical critical reading or literary context reading of any of the texts, including the John 3.17 text she cited. She also talks about the rabbis who were supportive somehow of different ways of doing this, sexually speaking. None were. Not a single rabbi ever supported transgender existence. Not, not even the one. trans rabbis? There's a lot of transgender rabbis. That's no, confusing. there are not a lot of transgender rabbis. There, wow. there are no transgender rabbis. Wow. Name me one transgender rabbi in the first millennium. Oh, you're going to narrow it. I don't oh, know. I'm I didn't gonna, I didn't look at yeah, the private text, but I'm going to ask. I'm I'll ask some rabbis. Time, of, of time closest to Jesus, the early church, the Old Testament, what they would have thought, right? There was a univocal understanding about these matters. There's no dissent. 
There was no G. I wonder what the scripture's pr presentation on this is. This okay. was a no brainer. I have to jump in here, partly because we're we're running out of time. I've got kids coming home. Megan's heading to a meeting. Um, and we could do this for ages and we actually might do a second part to this at some point. So stay tuned on that if you're listening on Facebook, but let's wrap this up in this way. Let's, um, ask you each for, and I know this will be difficult, but in like two minutes or less, just final thoughts. If you could say one last thing to the, the people that are listening that want to hear all your thoughts. And of course they can chase you down on social media later and I'm sure they will, but two minutes, just final thoughts, what you want people to hear. Uh, your take on this topic before we close out. I don't care who goes first, but Megan, you started the show, so maybe we'll let Dr. Gagnon start this. Perfect. Dr. Gagnon, did we lose you? Oh, I I would actually prefer if Megan go because I'm looking at something right now. Oh, okay. Fascinating. Okay. I just, I just want to say for anyone who's been watching this, who is trans, who has been um, harmed by this conversation, that I just want to say that God loves you and names you and your relationship with Jesus Christ is your relationship with Jesus Christ. Jesus never once asked anyone to vote on who got to be loved for God, and that continues. And, and I also want to just name for people, if you are for the first time starting to rethink some of the scripture texts that you have read and thinking about some of the abundant gender diversity within it, know that if Jesus can be born in a stable in the middle of the desert and three magi can show up and bring them beloved gifts and love this baby, if God can choose to become in flesh and bone and go through puberty, that's a thing Jesus did, right? If, if God can be a teacher and a preacher in a time when that was difficult, can, can divert some of the rules about purity and try to err on the side of love, if Jesus can come and say, hey, all these people who are outside of God's love, I found a way for you to come into. Know that the God who comes back and meets people on the road to Aramaeus, the one who preaches and proclaims the body and blood of Jesus Christ can be what sustains us, but whose body is not recognized by those around them, that during this time, when there's a few people left who aren't certain if God can love us, but God loves us. And that's way more important than who is right or wrong in this argument. If I'm wrong, I'm, I'm, deeply resting on the fact that God loves me more than how much I am wrong. And so I know for certain at the end of this conversation, God loves Dr. Gagnon too, regardless of who is right and wrong. And so keep your relationship with God at the center of what you are up to and what you are doing. In days when you need critique from community, listen deeply. In days when you don't, care for yourself and nurture your faith. I love you and God loves you. Thank you. All right, Dr. Gagnon, you got your two minutes now. God loves us enough to change us into his image by any means necessary. And mm -hmm. as C.S. Lewis noted, you know, if God were just some sort of cosmic sadist, maybe he would get his jollies after a while and leave us alone and let, we, let us do what we want. But instead, God is the great cosmic surgeon. He's interested in changing us, not just merely with cosmetic surgery, but deep tissue surgery, a total home makeover to make us into the image of his son, Jesus. That is not an easy work. That is a hard work. And it means denying innate desires to do what we want to do that God doesn't want us to do because it's not in our best interests. Transgenderism is, it would be unloving to say anything other than transgenderism is a sacrilegious attempt at overriding the structures of maleness and femaleness that God is embedded in us from creation and that's present in our biological reality, in our chromosomes, genitalia, internally, externally, hormones, dimorphic brain structures. Jesus Christ is Lord, not any impulses in our life. This is what the critical issue is about, not whether God loves us, but what does love mean? Hmm. And if love meant so much that Jesus could give his very life to rescue us from our own self-destructive sin, if that's what love and grace is, 
then love and grace can't possibly be God stepping aside and saying, go ahead and do what you want, irrespective of what I know to be right. Ultimately, we're going to have to decide whether we are Lord or Jesus is Lord. And that's why this is such a critical issue to discuss. And thank you for your time and your generosity and hospitality. Thank you both. Indeed, thank you both for joining us today. Uh, Megan is the pastor at Grace Lutheran in San Francisco. Uh, Megan, where can people find you? Facebook, Twitter, website? Yeah, all of those things. Facebook, Twitter, uh, MeganRoar.com. Last name, R-O-H-R-E-R. Correct. All Ancient right. German spelling. There you go. And Dr. Gagnon, people can find you on Facebook. I think we're Facebook friends. Uh, yeah. And Twitter. do you have a website or Twitter as well? Uh, okay. www.robgagnon.net. Okay. And uh, for those who are interested in learning more, if you don't mind me giving a little plug, I'm doing a, a course for HBU that's synchronous learning through Zoom. And uh, it's available to anyone in the nation who wants to take it as a survey, a very minimal cost. You can contact me on Facebook. It'll be a 16-week course on the Bible and sexuality. All right. Well, I want to thank you both for joining us and keeping it lively and staying true to what you believe. And we hope that we have had both sides represented fairly and equally. And uh, again, I'm Evan McClanahan. I'm the pastor at First Lutheran and for Sarah Stone at Memorial Drive Presbyterian Church. Uh, We'll catch you next time. Thank you. Bye, everybody. Thank you. Bye. God's blessings.